What do you expect? Some kind of space rocket with Batman on the controls? I'm Chris Spivey. And I'm Eddie Webb. And today on Genreless, we talk about Inferno, Verno, Verno. Good morning, everyone. We're in color this week, no longer in black and white. We have left the 60s behind us. Do away with all of your free love shenanigans, your shag carpets. No, we're in color. We're in the swinging 70s. Yes, yes. Um, And we are into one of the, actually the second almost kind of explicit reboot of the show. Now, it's, we went from let's recast our main character and have him act completely differently reboot. And now we're in the, let's change the entire premise of the show reboot. It's, 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 it's fascinating how this show just keeps changing every few years. Well, some of this change is actually because if we're, if I remember correctly, the ratings at the end of Troughton's era were not the best and they were debating about what to do with the show. Mm. And one of the reasons it got to come back is they didn't have anything to replace it with. The mm. move to color and taking more of a quarter mass feel was so it would would reduce cost, but also let them try to match some of the more. <clears throat> as I sit up a little straighter, tug on my uh, my coat color. American shows <laughs> with all their color and high and high greatness, they wanted to match those a little bit more. Your exactly your, your Star um, Treks, it, if you will. Since you mentioned quarter mass, Chris, perhaps you should explain that. All right. I am not in the UK. So for me, Quater, Quatermast is a is a brilliant white male scientist who solves Earth's problem with science, a team of people who aid him in that endeavor. And I want to say he's the lead of a is it a rocket science group and he fights monsters from the center of the Earth and all over the place. Doesn't sound at all like the third doctor being no, trapped on Earth all. with unit and the for one season only spectacular Liz Shaw. Would you like to give more insight into Quater Mass as it is more of your region? Uh, honestly, that's pretty much covered. Um, uh, it was uh, three short seasons. I think each is about six uh, episodes. Uh, and there was the interesting thing about it, it was done in the 50, late 50s. So it was done as live television. Uh, and I bring this up because fascinatingly, uh, around the early 2000s, there was a remake of Quater Mass that was still shot live. And David Tennant played Quater Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> so pre-Doctor Doctor and the connections with Doctor Who just kind of keep on coming. Well, David Tennant, the, the icon that he is, is the, the geek fan favorite on this half of the podcast, hands down. Because he was in the unit in the unit audios, in, from, in the unit audios, which was pretty incredible for the audio dramas before he became mm-hmm. the Doctor. Yep. He was Casanova. He was in mm-hmm. uh, this great, great show opposite. I think I mentioned this one before. The other doctor where he was a singing cop with a lot of, let's just say, uh, personal issues that had too much interest in David Morrissey's character who owned arcades. It was a gambler. It was life. The sad part is you said he, he, he appeared as a cop opposite another doctor, and I'm like, you have to actually narrow that down because there's two I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> but, and if anyone hasn't seen it yet, at least for on the U.S. side, they aired the PBS show of Around the World in 80 Days, and he was Phineas okay. Fogg with his two assistants, and it is basically a Doctor Who show without time travel from how it's almost portrayed from like the entire arc of it felt very Hoovian. It could just be because tenant and he brings that now wherever he goes, but it's true. The around the world 80 days was also pretty awesome. I may actually put that on our list of stuff to review sometime. Yeah. I have actually seen that one. Um, I was thinking of broad church um, where uh, uh, he's opposites um, the, the woman who eventually plays 13th doctor. Um, and I think that show predates both of them being doctor who I want to say. Um, so, uh, or maybe, no, I think, I think it was after Dave Tennant's run, but before, um, Jody Whitaker's, uh, I think so. Jody Whitaker's run. Um, so, uh, but still that's, that's shows you how 
fascinating because like uh, uh there was a a canard for a while that once you play a doctor you pretty much don't have a career after that um but if you look at the actual careers of people who've played the doctor that's certainly not true in the new era um but uh, uh, it's also not really true in this era because uh, John Pertwee uh, was an extremely well-established character actor. Um, and uh, after this uh, uh, went on to do, I mean, granted it was a quiz show, but still like, you know, he, he did Who Done It, which was a, a beloved uh, uh, murder mystery quiz show for a long time. Which ran um, like another five years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, he, he did a lot of other, very few other lead roles but he certainly was not hard up for work until he kind of semi-retired in the 90s before his eventual death um I, i've so, heard that a lot but i think most of that comes from the neck from the fourth doctor baker i don't think tom baker did a lot afterwards at least not to the same magnitude right right tom baker uh, um he kind of just had he did bits and pieces he was sherlock holmes uh once uh and that's all i'll say about that um, he was it was in Remington Steel. He was, I did not know that actually. <laughs> uh, he was a guest episode. His big kind of comeback was when he was the voice on Little Britain. He was the narrator on Little Britain, and that was kind of his next stage of life. Uh, and then eventually, not he, when he showed up in the D and D movie. He I knew I was going to do it. I saw you trying to avoid it. it. I geeked out when I saw it, and that is literally the only thing I remember about the original D and D movie. Um, and it still wasn't good, frankly. Uh, but I'm like, he did small stuff like, you know, going back to uh, murder mystery quiz shows. He spent a season playing Professor Plum in Cluedo in the 90s, Cluedo. Uh, but yes, Tom Baker didn't really have much of a career afterwards. Peter Davison generally did. Colin Baker did soap operas on both sides of it. Um, Sylvester McCoy also struggled after his Doctor Who run, but has since found a new career doing uh, parts in big movies, actually. Um, uh, and ever since then, uh, uh, Paul McGann was a big name actor even before his Doctor Who run. So, I mean, he didn't really never really hurt for work. Uh, same it goes with, back to the movie whatever. that I suggested that we potentially go in, go into, which is Whitnell and I for Paul McGann. Mm -hmm. Also, I recently discovered that um, he had a part in um, – there's uh, – Wales Interactive is a video game company that does full motion video interactive movies, um, just like they made back in the 90s, but actually with modern technology and quote-unquote good. Um, but there's uh, one that – where Paul McGann plays a uh, East London thug, and it's <laughs> hilarious and amazing because it's so clear he's – was hired for a day and kind of has no idea what's going on. And it actually works for his performance, which is fantastic. <laughs> and I'm just like, Oh, and literally it was like, Paul McGann's in this. It's five pounds. I don't care how bad it is. I'm going to play this. And I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I think a lot of that mostly falls around the Tom Baker era, but I also think it's because some of the stuff I read behind scenes that Tom Baker was not maybe the best person to have worked with towards the end of his run at Doctor Who. Uh, I think we talk about more of that when we get to Baker's run, but yeah. certainly there are, are two sides to that story. Um, but also Baker has flat out admitted that he was not uh, uh, the most charitable person to work with near the end. So there's a lot of it on the side of, yes, he wasn't. Um, but it is also way more complex and interesting than that. But yes, yeah, certainly he did not make me friends near the end. <clears throat> Like a lot, most stories in life are like that, though. Mm -hmm. But going back to Pertwee, since we're in this era right now, um, the reason we're here until, yeah, until Tom Baker, uh, Pertwee was the longest running doctor. And it, it seems like it's a weird short record because the guy immediately after him has a longer record, but still you have to realize he spent five years as the doctor, and that was an unheard of run at the time because, um, both uh, of the previous doctors had more or less two and a half seasons because the transition happened in the middle of season three. Um, so it's for a lot of people, Pertwee was, and frankly, to a certain generation of people still is the doctor. Uh, he was the first strong 
leading man character who shaped an entire generation of fans. The other doctors have their fans, don't get me wrong, but Pertwee is the person who kind of really set the mold in a lot of ways, which is fascinating because this show at this moment that we're looking at is very much not the show we're used to. It doesn't, the show never quite like this before or after for this long of a run. Um, in any ways, it's kind of a proto-Torchwood of all things. Uh, but the way that he portrays the character and comes across uh, uh, really does put the final stamp. We see the evolution of the Doctor between uh, Hartnell uh, you know, to Troughton and then to here, and this is kind of the final piece, the, 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 the triumvirate of, of establishing the Doctor uh, the way he is. Well, Pertwee is also the only Doctor that you could really envision being able to take a companion, a solo companion, and traveling around time and space having adventures without support. Yeah. The other Doctors needed their TARDIS crew larger to support them to be able to perform the functions they were trying to do. They right. did not seem... I guess the capable is not necessarily the right word, but they weren't able to do that. They didn't pro project that image that they could. It's not to right, say that Hart potentially they couldn't Hart in stories if written properly, but that wasn't there on the screen. No, because um, Hartnell honestly was was never cast to be that. And then in later years when his role evolved, was too ill to do that. Uh, and then Troughton was very much more of a of a character actor, uh, and particularly uh, played villains, as we talked about. Um, and so, and, uh, and his, Robin Hood, and Robin Hood, yes, thank you for for reminding me once again. Um, but still, I had to get that arrow uh, to, to go home. <laughs> I had to uh, Oliver Queen you, if you would. Uh, so you did this. Please, don't, please don't put me in an island for five years. Uh, but no, um, Troughton was doing something very different with the doctor and there still wasn't an entire confidence that he, th there still needed to be a, a Jamie style character still needed to be a, a peril monkey, if you will. Um, and so while the car starters crew reduced and there are bits and pieces of it where it's just one person, um, Trout was doing something different that did require a couple more people to have pieces on the board to get his portrayal across. No, um, it really wasn't until were McCoy that it was shown that they we were, could do that with one person. Sorry, but you're saying there are pieces where there for Troughton, there was only one other character with Troughton. I know there was the break where they first introduced Victoria, but Victoria essentially in that first episode where it was the Doctor and Jamie was a companion, like dropped down almost right away, essentially a companion. Right. I mean, I mean... Uh, this goes into a long fan debate about what constitutes a companion, um, and this is a weirdly frictious debate. Uh, but, oh, folks, you're about to see some juice now. I'm rolling up my sleeves. All right, Eddie. Uh, we, so we've been, we agreed a lot. Now it's time to like disagree. Yeah, this is where, this is where the podcast dies, right? Um, if we go with the assumption that a companion is someone who has come onto the TARDIS and has a, and and therefore follows the Doctor to another place, which again, it's, it's weirdly debatable, um, then there is a small gap where Jamie's the only companion. Um, because Paul, or sorry, um, uh, Ben and Polly leave, and Victoria comes on, there's a moment where Jamie's the only companion. Uh, from a writing standpoint, you're absolutely right. There is no meaningful point where there are not at least two support characters for Troughton's uh, uh, doctor in any run. And there was our big fight, folks. It was great. <laughs> it was vicious. Both sides clashed, and we came out to the exact same point we were before in absolute utter agreement. All right. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Um, but, but you're right. It, it's, you're right. This is the uh, for good and ill, and, and we're going to see the ill next week. Uh, but right now we're in the good. It's the idea of uh, the doctor and one female companion gets started here. And that is something that I disagree with, but understand it was the time that the show was made that it should have just been a companion, not necessarily a female companion. Right. But mm -hmm. they we'll go into a little bit of this accident that deals directly with Liz is that one of the reasons there were a few different ones at the time that, are, that I know of that L this is Liz's only se season that she's in is because they wanted someone to be doughy eyed to look up to the doctor for the doctor to be able to explain to them what's going on and say, doctor, 
what what's this doctor how can mm. we solve this problem doctor can you fix this and with liz they had a scientist which you even see in this episode liz is fixing the tardis with him yep mm. liz shaw kicking ass from the jump and so they didn't like that dynamic so for them liz wasn't performing the function of a companion and right, right. the actress uh carolyn john at the time I believe was pregnant and also found that the role didn't give her enough enjoyment to continue on. It was too limiting. And mm -hmm. there's even interviews where she said like the, fa this is one of her favorite episodes from what she did because it let her play Liz as a baddie and gave her more stuff to do. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Nicholas Courtney mentioned some of the same thing for him being able to play uh, the brigade leader. Mm -hmm. Um. And that's well, just two, th two things. Uh, um, one, you're absolutely right on, on all of that. Um, it, it's weird because there's this kind of canard that that the, the new show is stuck with, um, which is that that is the dynamic. This doctor and there's a younger woman, and the younger woman hands him test tubes and asks questions. And yet, if you look at classic Doctor Who, that dynamic only really exists at a couple of points, which is Joe Grant and uh, Perry, uh, and every other version. It's a bit closer to Liz Shaw, right? Like even looking now, like looking at at, at modern uh, Rose, Amy, Clara, they're closer to Liz Shaw than they are to Joe Grant. I would say that Rose was closer to Joe with an infusion of Ace. If we want to get down well, to like I mean, specifics, Ace, Ace is a third component. I'm not talking about just yet. Maybe keeping it just to the whole. This is the where that this gets stamped. Those are two poles. Ace is kind of a third triangle on that pole. You know, right? Um, but you're right. You're right. Right. Rose is much more templated from Ace, but Ace was also a way to reconcile these two poles to find a third path. But for a decade, at least, a couple decades, at least, um, this is what is believed in fandom to be the two sides of the companion pole. Um, but again, if you look back earlier, uh, Jamie is neither of these in the sense that he's played like he's an idiot. But as we saw in Enemy of the World, Jamie's not. He's extremely capable. He's just not as he's smart. He's smart in his own way, not the same way as the doctor. Um, uh, with Liz Grant, or, or sorry, with Liz Shaw, um, the idea that she didn't work as a companion is not true because she comes back. A version of her comes back explicitly as Romana, um, and implicitly in quite a few companion characters. You can make an argument for Nissa, for example, being a very similar to Liz Shaw character. <laughs> Romana, one of my all-time favorite companions in my oh, yeah. top five companions, hands down. For me, Romana won. Right. Um, but uh, to, we'll to your larger point, uh, the other thing that this era does, uh, which gets so up cards on the table, uh, uh, <laughs> me for a long time was not one of my favorite doctors. Um, I have come around to him, but it's almost in spite of Pertwee himself. Uh, because one thing that Inferno specifically shows is the strength of the supporting cast and how important that is for good Doctor Who. Uh, uh, so we, again, we, 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 we talk about the idea that there's this template of there's a single female companion, that's the archetype, but that's also not really true. Even if you look at this era, there's really, technically speaking, again, how you define companion, quote unquote, there's like five or six. Uh, because the unit supporting cast is, is a large chunk of what makes Sarah work. So this is a point where I would say that the first season or in with unit from how it's written, it is written to be more like quartermaster. How we mentioned earlier right. is that mm -hmm. the people working with the doctor are not companions. They function as colleagues. That is almost like a different cate categorization of how they are. Sure. Eventually mm -hmm. as the series goes on and he gets to leave earth, they become mm -hmm. slotted as companions, which means they become more, um, stereotypical and they fall into one note and they're asking the doctor more and more questions. But even in Inferno, you have the brigadier making active decisions and trying to like move things along by himself. You have Liz doing the exact same thing. It's less of people coming to the doctor saying, doctor, what should we do? Right. Mm -hmm. And the doctor has to try to move people into different spots or move them out of the way. Right. Right. Um, and, but when uh, Joe comes in and he starts traveling in the galaxy, it shifts that dynamic very firmly into I am doctor, you are companion. Sorry, you're saying. Well, yeah, but 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 even then, we 
uh, and we're, we're talking at the Joe a little bit here too much, but um, it's all related to the unit stuff. Even when the doctor has control of the TARDIS, spoilers, um, uh, and he travels with Joe, uh, he still keeps coming back to Earth. And it's a structure that, again, feels like particularly Russell T. Davies era of Doctor Who, which is that, yes, the, the Doctor and Rose go off and have adventures, but they keep coming back to the supporting cast. It's just the difference is in this case, the supporting cast is basically Quartermass, whereas in Rose, the supporting cast is a soap opera. Uh, so um, the idea that the doctor and a single female companion go off and have adventures and don't have any other supporting characters beyond them just doesn't hold up if you look at any sustainable length of Doctor Who. So it's weird that like this is both the template and also how lots of people, including myself, deeply misunderstand the era. I can see that. But um, I – Love the unit crew, and I wanted more of unit. And the yeah. further that we get away from unit, the more disgruntled I become. For instance, unit really drops off the face of the earth after like midway through Baker's run, where Baker yep. Tom Baker doesn't come back to unit anymore. Yep, actually comes it's actually uh, uh, Zygons is the last unit related uh, episode, which I think is season thirteen. Uh, so, um, but yeah, I mean you're you're absolutely right, and. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm – to go back earlier, I have actually grown to appreciate the Pertwee era because a lot of my viewing of it was the later era when it was just him and Joe, and I never quite clicked with it. But going back to the earlier stuff, the the dynamic between the Doctor and the Brigadier – and in Inferno, the Doctor, the Brigadier, and Liz is actually interesting, uh, and, and it, it's, it's, it's interesting to see someone who to some level stands up the Doctor. Too, since you mentioned Brigadier, this point I wanted to bring up, and it's a good segue back to it, is that the show, when it ended for the Troughton to Pertwee, it didn't have any connective tissue between those two until they landed on this idea, and the Brigadier suddenly became the connecting part between the previous Doctors and the current incarnation, because there were no companions carrying over, there wasn't the same Doctor carrying over. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons they brought the Brigadier, who was in two Troughton episode, two Troughton serials beforehand, yep. back as a primary force, like leading unit now. So that gives you a connection back to that doctor as a reference point, because I don't think in Spearhead from Space, we really get to engage with Pertwee until 15, 20 minutes really into the episode. Yeah. It's a lot of setup and running around. And ah, since we're not covering Spearhead from Space, the costume he wears isn't one that he assembled from a bunch of things. That was a doctor at a hospital's actual clothes that he stole. I <laughs> yep. want you to think about that. That pimp costume is from a doctor that worked in a hospital as their day job. Also, canonically, a third doctor apparently served in the Navy based on his tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> so we could go back now. To, we're, we're a little over the place today, but it's important because we're in a brand new era. So we're trying to reestablish a lot of different points for it. But John Pert Twee himself was an established actor beforehand. He served in the war. He actually avoided dying because he was taken off of a ship that he was serving on that was sunk by the Germans. And I think over a hundred thousand people died. And he was fortunately enough, like moved off of that ship. I want to say a week or so before it happened. I'm a little fuzzy mm -hmm. on the exact amount of time between it, but that is one of the reasons that he is still here and able to be the doctor. And one of the longest running audio shows that he was doing before this was, I think it called Navy Lark and it ran for about 17 years. Oh, and wow. he I was doing a, a version of his own military career on the show. And he, oh, acted, wow. yeah, he acted in a movie sometime before with, um, William Hartnell. Huh. So there's like all these little touchstones already between him and where in the show's origins. And when he was hired, much like Trout and he said, how do you want me to play the character? Mm -hmm. And for them, they said, we want you to play it like John Pertwee. Yeah. And he was like, oh, I get to be an idealized version of myself. So that's why we have all the, the action doctor with like the fighting, like the cars and the boats and all of that, because that was stuff that he was into. And they let him run wild with it. Mm -hmm. So that's and almost why from because... the jump. He's a doctor like who he is almost by the end of the first episode is who he is through the tenure of his run. 
yeah, yeah, because he's paid his himself. And, and it's interesting in interviews, he has said a few times that that was actually the hardest role he ever played as a result. Yeah. So an incredible actor. Is there anything else you'd like to do for the backstory? Because we, we rambled a while. I feel that we should get into the episode proper at this point. Yeah. Um. Uh, one other thing Um. To, for, for context, because, you know, I've been doing these kind of interesting facts to kind of, of give some context for the shows we watch. Um, and one that is uh, uh, a bit hard to remember because it, it's just shy of my own – like uh, this is like right before I was born. Um, but uh, the early 70s were a very uh, 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 tumultuous time for a lot of reasons, and one of them was that the fear of nuclear annihilation was not an abstract fear. Right. Um, one thing that culturally is that people genuinely thought that it was just a matter of time before we all died. Uh, so watching this episode, it's interesting to kind of see them playing with those themes on some level. I mean, yes, it's a silly parallel universe thing. Um, but also there's a there's a, a, a tension and an anxiety here that that still comes across today because that was something that was was very real to a lot of people at the time. Um, and so this probably would have played very differently. It probably would not have played as, oh, it's a silly sci-fi thing. It probably would have played as this is a what if scenario that we need to actually think about. Um, yes, the science is nonsense. And yes, the a lot of the concepts don't hold up well looking back, but the, the there's an energy here that is just gripping um, even though there, and something I mentioned to Chris as we were preparing for this was that this is the exact same length as the Daleks, and it does not feel like it. It's seven episodes, but it feels miles different than the Daleks did. Should have been five, but just saying. Still, four seven episodes, t- it's still not bad. A, a tight five would have been perfect. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Really agree. Um, I guess one other quick point then is that this was actually inspired by the uh, Molehill Project from the 1960s which was a a drilling thing to tap into the earth to try to find new re- to find um new energy sources which shut down because of mismanagement and a slew of other things that occurred like in the 60s so yep. just a, a tidbit of info and actually the original title i want to say was called the molehill project and it got shifted to inferno during the process oh okay cool any any last bits before we go on nope let's do it in All right. So I've combined the first two episodes kind of into big chunky blocks to see if that functions better. As always, we're evolving and I don't know how I want to do it yet. So I'm going to figure it out as I as I go through it. And I've actually written some information and we'll see if I use it or if I do what I am prone to do. (laughs) Color screen opens. Lava singing and driving as a doctor. Executive director, direct, executive director Sir Keith tries to stop a leak from tries to stop a leak, but is blocked by Professor Stallman and his condescending words. The technician that the executive director had brought in is infected by a green ooze from the leak. He does not turn into a teenage mutant ninja turtle for people that are curious, but we will see what he does turn into. The executive director mentions to Petra that he's hired a drilling instructor, Greg Sutton, because he wants someone on site that knows what to do if shit goes down. And for people with keen eyes, a black guy walks by and has a line and says, yes! The project is set to tap into the Earth's crust and discover a new energy source named Stallman's Gas by the asshole professor. Sutton, when he arrives, explains that he knows oil rigs, not this drilling device. But Sir Keith informs him that the drill is 20 miles deep right now. And the lab technicians have nicknamed the place the Inferno. There's a a cute scene of bonding between the Brig, Benton, and the Doctor. Where the Doctor looks at a picture of a young Brig without a mustache and makes a very cold comment that the Brig only raises an eyebrow over. And we find out the Doctor has requested access to this top secret drilling project for his own related experiments. And the Brig is trying to tell the doctor about the murder that transpired, a missing person, a wrench that was abnormally hot, but is still warm a day later. And when the doctor touches it, he makes an offhanded comment that high energy could have made it like that. And then he leaves. Uh, Sutton 
walking around the base, breaks countless HR regulations when he meets Petra, who gives him a sick burn. Stallman complains once again about all the precautions that are being taken to Sutton, and he points out, and as the doctor points out as he walks through the lab, that the computer is providing numerous warnings the project should be shut, shut down. Then he flicks on a power switch to siphon nuclear energy from, from Stallman's project for his own little project, and then he goes back to the TARDIS. We see Liz is working on the TARDIS by her fucking self. Um, and she asks if the doctor really plans to try to escape in the TARDIS. He says, yes, I'm leaving you motherfuckers to your own devices. Elsewhere on the compound, the technician has become a primoid and kills a scientist, inadvertently interfering with the doctor's own experiment. The Time Lord, when he activates it, is trapped in limbo. And we get a freaky psychedelic scene. That should have been on a Nick Fury cover comic until he's <laughs> saved by Liz. And when she asks him how he's doing, he describes a barrier that he couldn't break through and needs to do another trial run to understand what's going on. The drill goes awry and, em and an emergency ensues. Stallman orders the drill to keep running regardless of the danger. The doctor and Liz arrive at the drilling, uh, informing them about a nuclear power surge, and the brig tells him that one of his soldiers has been murdered. And to end the first episode, a primoid jumps out, breathing heavy because he's run too far. An explosion. Uh, during the explosion, the unit dispatches the primoid, Sutton, and an unnamed black scientist save the day. The dead primoid radiates heat akin to the wrench that they discovered previously. The doctor links it back to a volcanic eruption in Karkoa in the 1890s and is later attacked by a primoid unit soldier who falls over the roof during his attack and the doctor warns everyone not to touch him. At the same time, Stallman orders the drilling to be increased by another 12%. Uh, they discover a sample, they've contained a sample of the green goo in a container that they want to examine. But Stallman picks it up, puts it in a box, and says, no one sh shall examine it. Drilling must go on. The doctor forces him to review the computer's warning, which he again ignores, and orders to have the power to the doctor's experiment cut in response for being questioned. Stallman notices his hands begins to turn green, the same color as the others had before him. The infected professor disables the computer and is confronted by the doctor at to asking him what's in his pocket. Back at the TARDIS, Liz fixes Liz fixes the bypass circuit and the doctor sends her back into the inferno while he does push a few buttons, which he secretly uses to power up the TARDIS and attempts to escape. The Liz and the brig run back to see the TARDIS dematerialize with the doctor and Bessie. So a little I, bit I, went I on there. Respect you, appreciate I appreciate you talking about the primords like they're really really important and they're not just green werewolves because they're just green werewolves <laughs> they're not they they're highly resistant to bullets they're super strong with fuzzy face not werewolves green at all. Wolves. green goo werewolves the the funny part is though the primoid i got not from the show because the show doesn't name them no it doesn't <laughs> I actually had the Inferno book because I bought it as a kid that was published in like 84. Oh, wow. Which I, I, I broke out briefly, but I also saw online that everyone calls them Prime Woods. So I called them Prime Woods to help center it in. Otherwise, originally I had like retrograded humans and all these other things like that's too long. <laughs> in my, in my, 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 my own mental notes, I just green werewolf because that's what they look like. Um, can't, but, can't do it. They're not werewolves. There is there's a lunar cycle involved potentially with werewolves, depending on which werewolf mythology you want to go down. They could be cannibals that have eaten people. And it depends on which werewolf mythology you want to go down with. Well, I mean, also there are werewolves who um, are touched by Satan and have a mark on their hand as a result of that touch um, before they turn into werewolves. But we also know from the seventh doctor that there are werewolves. And if you show them a big flashy circus light, they transform. <laughs> uh, only, only if you're with uh, a, a circus of space hippies. But we're not there. <laughs> we're not there. Um, 
So, so having having said that now, why do I love this show? <laughs> it's one of those things that when you when you actually summarize the plot, it you realize just how bonkers it is. Um and not necessarily in a great way. Uh be, <laughs> but uh one thing that's interesting just from a a historical standpoint, like from a fandom standpoint, is we're still seeing the last vestiges of the doctor is a selfish jerk, right? Uh, um, it's something that was very heartenal. Um, Troughton largely got rid of it, but still occasionally popped back up. And we talked about it like in Enemy of the World, where he's like, I'm going to go swimming and screw you people. Um, uh, we're still seeing bits and pieces of that here. It actually, to be honest, gets slightly worse uh, near the end. Uh, but um, the idea that the doctor is obsessed with getting his TARDIS working and going back into traveling in time and space is an interesting character arc, which is something the show has never really done before. Uh, it's not a successful character arc because uh, it kind of just gets resolved because he punches a guy in the ancient man of universe in the face. But the idea that they're at least tempting that is interesting. So one of the things that we did breeze over earlier is that in the war games, at the end of it, the doctor has to call in the time Lords and the time Lords show up and they're dressed very plainly in like robes without high colors. Yeah. And they basically fix a problem. But what they do is they erase both Zoe and Jamie's memory and they force the doctor to regenerate and as punishment. They drop the doctor on earth, having removed bits of his own knowledge to fix the TARDIS and they disable the TARDIS, making it impossible for it to travel through space and time. So in yeah. fact, exiling him to earth, in this time period that is a important bit to know and the third doctor when he regenerates he gets liz shaw's job because the unit was trying to hire liz as a scientific advisor when the doctor sort of swaggered in and the brig goes hey i know you you're the doctor i'll hire you and liz gets has to become his assistant right and so the doctor is trying to use unit the resource and access to fix his tardis to leave i think at mm -hmm. this point in time he doesn't know that the time lords removed some of his own knowledge to fix the tardis i think he discovers that next season right right um and what's interesting is also there's a this is one of the things where because our perception of how things evolved have changed liz shaw actually gets better as a result of this because the initial idea for the tardis was always that the doctor invented it uh and look well, Actually, at one point, he's also a future human. So, I mean, there's muddiness around this. But but um, that's something that we know for a fact because it actually shows up in the two Doctor Who movies that came out in the 60s uh, that, that he created the TARDIS. And that is something that was still kind of lurking around in the writer's minds at this point. So Liz being able to help the Doctor fix this is not as implausible as it sounds now uh, because theoretically – if the doctor made the TARDIS, then someone else could help him to, to continue to fix it. Uh, we now know that the TARDISes are, are, are grown and they're actually creatures and there's all sorts of, of wonderful, glorious nonsense around TARDIS lore. Uh, so Liz being able to help the doctor fix it inadvertently helps elevate her even more to where she is a brilliant scientist and probably should not have in fact been passed over for a ramshackle time lord with most of his memory missing. <laughs> but you know, Who, you know how it is trying to get hired in the seventies as a woman. So, Well, it's also, the show is called Dr. Who. It's not called Liz kick it, kick it ass every day or the brig shooting you in the face. Although I would watch both those spitoff shows. Yeah, side note of interest for the BBC and Disney plus now. If you want to make those, right. I'm still there. Um, um, go ahead. No, I was just going to talk about the brig. Oh, I was, I was going to talk about Liz. That may have been like my whole conversational piece for this entire episode. Nothing but just like Liz. Praise them, Liz. <laughs> well, but if you want to talk about, about the brig. brig. No, no, no. That's, that's okay. Okay. All right. Um, uh, again, this is one of those things that um, – if you're just kind of watching it casually, maybe you don't quite notice it, but when you, when you go back and watch these things with the kind of analytical mind, um, the Brigadier is is a fascinating character because his superpower is nothing faces him. Absolutely nothing. And this is a fantastic example of that. Um, and there's another even more fantastic example of it in, in next week's episode. Um, but the, the Hoster can just spout anything to the Brigadier and the brigadier is going to do two things. One, not understand it. And two, ask, okay, so what do we do? And 
it's amazing because he just no sells the most insane concepts. <laughs> but the brig knows what to do. It's called five rounds rapid. Right. And that right. is the answer to most of the problems. It doesn't work, but it is the answer to most of the problems. Um, while we're talking about the unit, I'm going to say Benton is my favorite unit member. I love fucking Benton. I loved him as a kid <laughs> when I watched the show. I was like, I like that guy. And I, when I went back and I read some of the novelizations they put out later where Benton shows up, if, you, mm-hmm. if you've read through them, Benton is still a solid, utterly loyal, reliable friend not quite companion because he didn't really get to travel with the doctor that is always there and then now having been in the military i like benton even more because that is the type of person that you want in your squad all the time like that yeah yeah oh um benton has a really good capacity the the brig and benton actually work really well as a, as a as a team um because the brigadier is the person trying to look at the big picture and is no selling these non these weird concepts because he has to try to make sure everything is, is working properly. And Benton is a person who's constantly in over his head by the weird concepts, but is that kind of working class. Okay. But let me just follow orders and get things done. Um, so he, he's the kind of non-com you want on your side. Absolutely. <clears throat> and I'm going to say now as a, a future point, I fucking hate captain Gates. There you go. I said it. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not a fan of Gates either. From from the drop when he showed up. All right, but we're not here to, to bash Yates. We're here to talk about the greatness that is Professor Stallman, who is obsessed with getting a new energy source to be named after him and the sheer ability to know that bureaucracy has empowered this dangerous man to act. Right. Um, and that's another interesting point for Doctor Who that we haven't talked about. Um, in the 60s... Uh, there, there was this idea in science fiction that scientists were just inherently good, right? Um, the idea that if someone was a scientist, that gave them a certain ethical clout. Uh, you can see bits and pieces of this throughout the 60s black and white runs where the doctor will have some form of, but he's a scientist. I can reason with him. And those conversations happen. Uh, we're now in the early 70s where – because, again – Science created something that could destroy absolutely everything on the planet. There's a bit more skepticism about science now. Um, and so now we're seeing scientist characters being portrayed in a very different way than they have previously in Doctor Who. Now, of course, it's balanced because we have good scientists and bad scientists. So you know, scientists are not an inherently corrupt concept. Uh, but the idea of someone like Stallman – Stallman in even a couple seasons earlier – would have been written very differently. Stallman would have been the one point of sanity in an otherwise uh, a corrupt organization. Stallman is, in fact, in this version, the center of the corruption. Although you still have the doctor constantly giving Stallman opportunities and chances and the doctor dropping at every opportunity that, well, I'd rather talk to a scientist than you, you soldier, you ruffian. Which there's a, a brilliant contrast, though, for the Pertwee character who is thoroughly rebellious for his own actions, but yet expects everyone else to uphold authority. Like late, there's that is interesting to watch right now. We're yeah, very there, much him being to be rebellious because it, he doesn't have other people there. Um, in my head, it is summarized by uh, Paul Cornell, who did a lot of doctor who novel writing back in the nineties. And I think does uh, a fair amount of uh, doctor who writing these days. Um, kind of summarized it in a rant online by saying that uh, for, for talking about the Pertwee era, that the Doctor had become a Tory. That's kind of the, the, <laughs> the limits of it. Um, but certainly one of the things that it's still I don't like about the Pertwee era is that we, we frankly, we have an authoritarian Doctor. Um, he's extremely cozy working with the military. Um, he's gives some resistance against broad military retaliation but also doesn't really push that hard against it um and, and to your point um this he doesn't know what's entirely going on but he is perfectly happy to a go in and just stomp all over this months or year long project because he thinks he knows better and then b completely siphon off critical power from the experiments to benefit his himself oh uh, this is our hero too um yeah. I want to point out once again, 
because it is a rare occurrence that they had black men running around in lab coats and one of them helped yeah. save the day. Like they, yeah. they don't get a lot of lines and it's very brief, but I pointed out some of the other stuff. I'm going to point this out. And every time it happens, I'm going to point it out and make a big thing about it because any other doctor who review or podcast you listen to or talk to will likely not mention it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's good, good to do. Um, it, it, again, I'm, that's one reason I'm glad we, for all the reasons is frustrating. I'm glad we did, uh, um, uh, enemy of the world because Ugh. it's an extremely <laughs> rare case of a, a of a black actor having some decent lines and a decent character even though all sorts of problems around it so you eddie as now since you live over in the uk and have a full understanding of british law and bureaucracy and how it works uh, clearly, um, yes, obviously. why was stallman allowed to do what he did and sir keith who's the executive director had no authority to stop him from proceeding to keep drilling regardless of the dangers involved in it the way i understand it um is that uh stallman had gotten authority for doing this and sir keith was there as an observer only so the only way sir keith could stop it is if he can get the original authority that was given to stallman overturned which is why he has to go back to london and why that's a big thing um another piece is if i'm getting my timelines correct uh this is still around the point where england thought they had a space program in them that they could make uh so there was a a, a brief but noteworthy push of British politicians really trying to get science off the ground as fast as possible to be part of the space race. Um, and they both came into it way too late and also uh, uh, in the middle of their <laughs> empire falling apart around them. So didn't quite happen, but that's why you still see, particularly in Pertwee era, references to a, to a British space program, um, which okay. just absolutely didn't happen. But it's presented as if, oh, of course it'll happen. Um, so, so I think it's kind of happening in the background of this story is that – it's the audience would perfect. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, uh, some random person in London that's kind of vaguely defined would have just r blank checked this scientific exploration without really too much oversight. Oh, that's good to know. Thank you. Um, so another question for you about Sir Keith. Do you know any other episodes that Sir Keith shows up on in Doctor Who? I mean, what, which one would you like? Would you like Talons of Wang Chiang, where uh, he plays uh, one of the <laughs> two great people? Or do you want um, the the uh, uh, the Wasp and the whatever, where he plays another? Yep. Uh, yep. Yep. Star the Agatha character. Christie mystery. Yeah, Agatha Christie one, yeah. And oh, I forgot the other one because I want to say he's in the third one too. Damn it. All yeah. right. I only got two thirds of my own joke. Damn it. All right. So, <laughs> I feel you, man. It is it is such fun though watching like this episode unfold for at least the first part to see all the pieces being lined up into place. Even though the primoids were not originally in the script, I think they were just added so we can have monsters in the show. I think the series would have run better if they had not added them, and it had been strictly Agreed. like that human drama. But I don't think they had faith that that would have carried the show. Agreed. What do you think? Oh, uh, so I'm, I'm full of random tidbits about this episode because as I enjoyed it so much, even though it's a little long, that Petra was originally cast to be a uh, Kate O'Mara, a.k.a. the Ronnie later in time. Oh, OK. The actress plays. Wow. But they had scheduling conflict. So instead, they have the current actors. Who I want to say was the wife of one of the directors or co co writers or something. Hmm. That uh, explains a lot. Hey, she's doing the best she can. She's doing her best. The she's living her best life. she has. It is, though, interesting to see they brought in a drilling expert to come, a um, oil rig expert to come into a drilling adventure. And then suddenly Sutton almost becomes our protagonist. No, sorry, Sutton Santa becomes our hero while the Doctor remains our protagonist because Sutton is running around doing the hero stuff, almost filling a Jamie-esque role while the Doctor yeah. is mostly running away, running around, which I'm going to come to that the rest of that in a minute. Yep, I, I disagree with you. It, it, was, it was very clearly, um, we need someone to fill this role, so let's bring someone in. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about in the first two episodes? I gave it a, a big... 
synopsis. So we could dive into it. We can move on. Depends on how you feel. I, I, I have some thoughts about the next chunk. I thought you might. Episodes three and four. Stallman cuts the power, trapping the doctor, and refuses to reinstate it as he expanded, as he expands a drilling drilling time. The doctor awakens to see unity is strength. Then he leaves the garage where his door handle doesn't work anymore. He pull, drives out Bessie slowly, takes a look around the area. It looks shockingly the same until bullets riddle all around him. He's being attacked by units. He escapes with Bessie in another captivating fight driving scene and he spies the back of liz with black hair and knowing liz is a blonde he calls out liz and liz turns around and captures the doctor the doctor is in question by the brigade leader stewart and he realizes he's on a parallel earth in a alternate dimension uh the doctor interacts with the parallel earth counterparts and discovers that sir keith was killed in a car accident on his way to report stallman during an emergency with the drill, the doctor escapes momentarily before being recaptured without repairing the computer. Section leader Shaw saves him from being saves him from the firing squad and provides him an, provides enough influence for the doctor to fix the computer, thus causing more strife between the staff and Stallman. Stallman agrees, following the doctor's agrees to follow the doctor's plan. Liz questions him about the other her and discovers that Liz is a scientist something she once thought of doing. The brigade leader and Liz inter 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 interrogate the doctor until he admits the TARDIS slipped him sideways in time, managing to trick Stallman into exposing his infected hand before being jailed. Section leader Shaw believes the doctor to be a free speech demonstrator. <laughs> Inside the cell, the doctor takes a little nap. After he awakens, he sees his cellmate is a primoid! The primoid kills a unit soldier. He e primoid easily bends the bars to enter the doctor's cell. The doctor best him with a mattress. Yes. Let me repeat that in case you missed it. The doctor best the superhumanly strong, superhumanly tough primoid with a mattress. Escaping locks the cell door, and the primoid looks sad throughout the cell door rather than bending the bars to escape. Um, the doctor escapes. He sneaks into the inferno in disguise, only to be discovered by the brigade leader while trying to stop the countdown. Before being shot, he is saved by Sutton, but at gunpoint, but then he's suddenly at gunpoint from Stallman. I have so much to say. Uh, that could have been one episode. I mean, yes, but um, the first thing, which I, which I admit I forgot about the first two episodes um, the the endless glee I had in the show feeling very clever about having an automatic garage door opener for multiple episodes. I loved it. Oh, I loved it. It was like because that was probably genuinely like an exciting thing in the seventies, and I'm just like, it's like a fucking garage door opener. Why are we so excited about this garage door opener? It's like, nee, nee, nee. No, we're gonna, we're gonna show this every episode. Nee. <laughs> what that is though is a precursor to the sonic screwdriver. Brickers, so Sean Scrave have been around for a while, but but yes, in terms of now, have when did the Sonic Screwdriver yeah, show up? Troughton had a Sonic Screwdriver initially. I'm trying Granted, to remember that. It was literally just a screwdriver that happened to use Sonic waves. I mean, it, it did nothing Doesn't else count. except for unscrew things. Doesn't count. Well, it's a Sonic. It's you, literally called the Sonic Screwdriver. You, you know the Sonic Screwdriver I'm talking about that is used to ignosium until it's destroyed in the Fifth Doctor's run. Because they got sick of it. It is the precursor to the Omni tool that we know is the, the, the Sonic Screwdriver, yes. Thank you. <laughs> I will grant you that. <laughs> but it's still hilarious. Um, uh, but no, uh, so the show has there's a lot of things. Um, one is it is both weird that it took this long to do a parallel universe story. And also weird that we haven't done very many parallel universe stories since. It's a, it's a trope that Doctor Who actually rarely does. It's just yeah. bizarre. I can think of two off the top of my head, like this one and the one with the uh, Cyberman with Tenet. Yeah. Yeah. And that was. I feel there's one I more. Mean, how do you slice sure. that? And it's going to say that whole <clears throat> parallel universe arc, really, but. It hasn't really been done since. Um, it, it's something Doctor Who just doesn't do, which of all of the shows that you would think would do a lot of that, you'd think it'd be Doctor Who. It just doesn't do it very often. Would the E Space. Trilogy technically count? 
No, because it's not parallel. It's alternate. Yeah. I'm talking Otherwise, about the, the trope of you see people that act differently from the know. characters we already recognize. Yeah. All right. It's been done early Russell Davies in here, and it's pretty much yeah. it. Like, that's a total waste of genre stuff they could have done. But one of the reasons yeah. it was done here is because of the constraints that they put on the show that it had to be on Earth, and that left them, like, with mad scientists or alien invasion. And this was kind of a right. way to subvert that, but still stick to that norm they'd established. Mm -hmm. um, which is another point is um, uh, uh, we're looking at a show. One of the reasons why they did the Earthbound format, there are lots of reasons, but one of them was to try to save money. Hilariously, ended up being more expensive than the previous versions of the show. But um, this was one of the ways they tried to stretch that out was like, we could make just seven episodes. So you had this weird moment of like you watch two episodes thinking the show's going to be a certain thing. And then it goes, nope, we're a parallel universe story now. <laughs> and it just lives there for three episodes, four episodes. Um, so it's kind of a story inside of another story in a way. Which – since you mentioned that, the interest, another interesting point is that from Troughton, they went down from like 40-something to 27-something mm -hmm. for per year for recording. So that was like a, a massive shift also to sort of reduce some of the costs because you have less episodes that you're also making. Right. Um, uh, so looking at it from the perspective of this was largely a budget measure that they wrote it this way. Um the reason why it's seven episodes is very much because they're clearly trying to stretch it out. And you're right. If you're tr truly from a story perspective, this could be a tight five, maybe even four. Um, because to be honest, a lot of the parallel universe stuff, you can just cut from a pure plot point, right? <laughs> from a pure entertainment point, you can't because it leads to my favorite Nicholas Courtney story ever. Uh, because you have Nicholas Courtney wearing an eye patch for reasons because he's evil, right? Uh, and um, apparently he was struggling to find the character, which is just a hilarious sentence mm -hmm. to think of. It's like you're playing the evil brigadier. <laughs> I respect the fact that you think this is an acting challenge, but okay, but let's let's go with this. And so the, the crew to help him, the cast to help him out is he did the he does the, the spin around and he sees the brigadier with an eye patch. That's like the big shock. Um, uh, the director was like. Um, I think when I get back, could you could you do, could you do it again? Um, and he's like, sure. So he goes there and he's like, oh, well, yeah, you know, action is this there. And he waits, waits a weirdly long time. And finally, the director's action, he turns around and all of the cast and all of the crew are all wearing eye patches. And he just <laughs> loses it. Um, and then it, 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 so, so apparently the story goes, is like it, it since then he realized, oh, yeah, I, I, I should be having fun with this. And then ever since then, he found the brigade leader much easier to tap into. Um, I love that story partially because I love the fact that Nick Courtney was had, confident enough to be able to, to poke fun at himself. Um, he's a treasure and he's missed. Uh, but also <laughs> it's a reminder that this show is silly, <laughs> right? It's a silly, silly show. And sometimes you, you, you it, 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 I love the fact that I get wrapped up in it and I have to take a step back and go, oh, wait, this show is kind of silly. And I love that. <laughs> But part of it, though, is for the this run, even though Pertwee was kind of more of a known of a comedic actor, he didn't take it as comical how Troughton did before him. He took he was more seriously in approaching it. They're comedic bits, but it's not like a comedy. Yeah. And it's also interesting because um, Pertwee, from all accounts, this is just anecdotal and sadly all the people involved are, are, are gone now, but anecdotally um, – we kind of took the whole job as a lark. Apparently, it, it's the he, he just loved playing it. He thought the character's great. Again, he's playing himself, um, and so he never took the job. He did it all professionally, but never took it seriously. Troughton, who played a silly character, was an extremely serious actor. Um, carefully read scripts, would 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 pitch his lines, and clearly thought through his line readings. Um, Pertwee would kind of just show up on set and start spelling the lines. It, it's not an admonishment of either man's methods. They both clearly worked. But it's fascinating that the quote-unquote silly character was played by an extremely serious actor, and the quote-unquote serious character was played by a char uh, an actor who was just having fun with it. So is that why we get uh, reverse the neutron flow from Pertwee so much? Yes, because 
much. Perk, we hated memorizing Technobabble and just said, I like the sound of this line. Please put it in every script possible so I don't have to memorize Technobabble. That's exactly why reverse ne neutron flow, reverse the polarity of neutron flow became such a catchphrase of his. <laughs> All right. What do you think of the Earth, the parallel Earth counterparts of like the Brig, Liz, and Stallman? And of course... <laughs> Sutton, because Sutton is like all over the place. <laughs> um, I am glad that the – I'm with you in the sense of um, it was a chance to actually give the unit support cast something to put their teeth into, right? Um, and that shows here. It, we weirdly learn more about the support cast because of these parallel versions. They, they, they have a – a, they end up backfilling some depth into those characters, and that's great. Um, and it's very clear that's what – some of this was like hey, if we're going to – extend this concept that has maybe three episodes in it and seven episodes. Let's give our supporting cast some cool stuff to do. Great. I'm all for them. Uh, so evil Liz Shaw, evil Lethbridge Stewart, evil Benton even completely on board. And then we have the other characters who are the same characters, but wearing white <laughs> because Stallman Besides wearing white and glasses, is basically the same character. Uh, his assistant picked up is, one notch. Right, right. They're, they're all just basically be slightly more clipped and British about things, but otherwise you're playing the same role. Um, I felt like the concept was we're going to do evil unit, and then oh, we have to make evil versions of the other characters, but we haven't really established the other characters. Even Sir Keith is not evil, Sir Keith, right? It, so there, there's a chunk of the concept that's just missing it's just the exact same characters except for there's a, a faster clock because of things that happened the way they did we don't know if sir keith is evil or not he's well he's dead so it's not, not evil sir keith but he'd be decomposing sir keith right um but on the flip side the one thing i found interesting is that uh, this is very clearly 1984 right i mean that's it's clear what they're going for they're going for a, a, mm -hmm. a version 1984 and the show doesn't really explain what that is, which shows you how much the British audience knew what 1984 was. It's a science fiction story that they assumed that the mass audience would just recognize. So, yeah, there's its authoritarian England, and um, we'll put a few posters up and we'll make a few references. But people will get, oh, this is Doctor Who in 1984. Um, so it was interesting how they just didn't bother to explain it whereas again the other touchdown we talked about the rest of the event, they spent a lot of time explaining how this is a parallel universe and what actually happened and why it's this way this is like nope it's just fascist england let's move on well i actually like this idea of doing it more than the Agreed. russell t davis version no i completely agree I, I like the fact that they treated the audience again this is the show with with green werewolves it's still treating an audience as reasonably intelligent viewers it's not talking down to them it's trusting that they can keep up with this uh which is fascinating because on the one hand it is a show that as i've said before is very silly but it's for seven episodes they could have padded it out in different ways and the way they chose to pad it out was more action sequences rather than more explanation which it would have been very easy to go the other route i appreciate the fact that they just let me get on board with nope this is parallel universe they're evil version. They're under a fascist organization. And now the doctors could have a punch up with Benton. And that is inherently a fun thing to watch. And they're correct. They're correct. That is a fun thing to watch. And think about the age demographic who is the larger percentage of their audience for them doing it also. Like that in and of itself is a massive compliment to those kids because right. it's, still, it's still known as a kid show. And they're yep. giving you this right there. Like that's all you get. And to have them love it and still keep up with it. That's why this is still lauded is one of the best classic episodes. Yeah. And again, a cultural thing to think about is um, this is pre-Star Wars, right? So science fiction is not mass media. Uh, I mean, love or hate Star Wars. Regardless, I'm not, we're not here to debate Star Wars. That'll be another episode, I'm sure. But Star Wars changed how science fiction was saw, seen by the world. Science fiction became culture it stopped being this this subculture stopped being an isolated thing it was something that everyday people watched and appreciated we're not there yet we're still several years from that so to have a science fiction show just incorporate 
a very clear literary illusion and roll with it again is and for kids is just breathtakingly confident and before we get back into the episode proper for some more bullet points just to we didn't say this up front but i think it is obvious for anyone that knows this this run of the doctor is also heavily heavily influenced by james bond like there's no way not to see that but we didn't say it but in case someone needs us to say it Oh, and also, um, although we referenced it uh, uh, last week, um, it's also influenced by the uh, Batman TV show, too. Yeah, hence my, one, my original, to color. Yep. My, my quote about Batman and a rocket ship. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. And I just want to point out, again, he beat a super strong, super tough person with a mattress. That, that is yep. my last comment on this whole section, because it is great, and there's stuff that goes on, but I don't necessarily know if there's anything to dive or delve into other than the great acting scenes that we have. Is there anything um, else you'd like to touch on specifically? Uh, the reason why I, another reason why I mentioned Batman actually, because you mentioned the, the, the mattress um, is Benushi and karate or Aikido, whatever you want to call it. He all the different things. Um, <laughs> it's, he literally just pokes two fingers, in someone's chest and they fall down. Right. It's, it's not the most elaborate action sequence ever. Um, but again, it's this weird blend of it's it's almost camp action, which is why not only uh, Batman but also n- not just James Bond, but very specifically, we're we're this is the era of Roger Moore, which is also camp action. So um, th- this idea that action can be a little heightened and silly is okay is something that Bert was absolutely playing with, and it helps that. Venetian Aikido means that you don't have to worry about a whole lot of uh, stunt choreography. We could go and talk about the big sleep and that kick scene that I love to bring up. When, <laughs> when Humphrey Bogart lightly taps him with his foot, and they go flying 20 feet away from him. <laughs> if you'd like to hear our thoughts on the big sleep, please subscribe to the Dark Hue Patreon. <laughs> um, you mentioned it. So best two bonds. Who are they? <sighs> This is a personal choice, like, so there's like there's no shame. Personal, personal, or, or most influential, because there's a different list. Personal, personal. Um, Daniel Craig. Uh, and it's a toss up between Roger Moore and Sean Connery. I'll oh, with Sean Connery. Cool. How about you? Um, Sean Connery. Mm. Yes, I. I I, I love the work they did in it, and he is legendary. And uh, Pierce Brosnan, because I was a huge Remington Steel fan, and I like Pierce Brosnan. And his movies were not the best, but I liked him in the role. No, yeah, I mean, again, Pierce Brosnan was a hard. I, I, he almost said Pierce Brosnan because he did his best. He did his damned best. <laughs> and to know that he actually lost the initial role to Remington Steel. Sorry to James Bond because he was in a Remington Steel contr- contract and they wouldn't let him out. Yep. Mm-hmm. And they still had to fight later to get him to be able to do it. Uh, any final comments about Doctor Who, less about the Remington Steel that I keep interjecting to the show? So <laughs> <laughs> do we do Remington Steel run, but no, let's move on. Episodes five and six. Penetration zero. Rocks the inferno. All the technicians try to escape. Large parts of the base explode into fire and green ooze flows as... Doc, as a doctor and Sutton try to turn off the valve, but are attacked by Stallman inside the core. When they lock, when they lock the room and ex- ah, when the room is locked, people are exposed to the green goo. The brigade leader explains the global impacts of the inferno right now. They've been ordered to stay here, and he's been given command. The doctor explains that the heat and pressure will make the earth dissolve into nothingness. Everyone <laughs> attempts. Everyone attempts to deal with the reality of the situation. Section leader Shaw is convinced to help the doctor save the other Earth and their other selves. He demonstrates to TARDIS to prove to the brigade leader that he's telling the truth. The infected Stallman and a force of primoids emerge from the core. I want to point out, since I didn't put it right here for you, that Stallman takes, a primo- takes the people inside the core's face, rubs it in the green goo, 
to infect them to become prime ones one by one rub them in the green goo how as an actor would you feel about that that you're sitting there you're like a day payer you're getting like what a pound a day to be there and this <laughs> guy put your face in green likely stinky cold goo um yeah the infected stallman and the primoids escape the core trapping everyone while they infect bitten the doctor closes the cor- closes the door and access to the heat, which we find out the hotter it is, the stronger they grow. On main earth, Sir Keith is in a car accident due to Stallman's interference. He paid the driver to delay St- to, dis- to delay Sir Keith, but Sir Keith discovers it. The driver acknowledges it, and as they're turning around, the driver is so thankful that he tells Sir Keith that he owes him a lot and doesn't pay attention to the road and car accident. The brig also can't find Sir Keith, and he questions Stallman before ordering him to stop the drilling. Stallman, of course, laughs at that. On Inferno Earth, the brigade leader admits to Shaw he'll force the doctor to take them with him. They jury-rig the machines to send all the power to the shed with the TARDIS console, when the doctor and Sutton, where this doctor and Sutton are. As more explosives get closer and closer, everyone makes it to the shed, and the brigade leader breaks down. Petra and Sutton go back to try to get the power working because it didn't previously work. Moments before the doctor dematerializes, the brigade leader draws down on him, forcing him to take them all, saying he'll shoot him right there. And he is saved by Liz, who shoots the brigade leader in the back. As the lava flows closer to the shed, the doctor says, fuck y'all, I'm out, and leaves him to die. Uh, so as so, you can uh, see the notes that I have written down. Yep. Necessarily, what I'm saying is not on the page, so that's why Eddie doesn't. Necessarily, that's why occasionally you hear Eddie will laugh because I write something down, much like if I run a game, I'll have notes sometimes, or I'll just have bullet points. And whatever I've written down is not going to be whatever we do. It's going to be whatever yep. I decide in the moment. I've I've written scenarios for groups of people before to run at conventions, and when I run them by myself, they're different than when I run them with other people. I've had someone say, oh, yeah. "What the fuck was that game?" It's like, oh, you all weren't in there to help, so I just ran my game. It's like that's not what you wrote. I know it's not what I wrote. <laughs> I, I have I have absolutely written notes for convention games, knowing I'm running the same game three or four times during a convention, and each game is different because I'm yep. just riffing each time. Um, you go with the energy of the room. But one of the things I was laughing at was was you reminded me. It's a small scene, but the Sir Keith talking to the driver on main Earth scene is hilarious because it basically boils down to. Hey, are you are you in the pay of the person trying to disrupt me? And the driver goes, "Yep, it's a fair cop. Please don't do that." <laughs> okay, let's turn around. That's the whole scene. I'm like, "What?" I'm expecting like you know, the driver to pull him over, pull a gun. The, the driver's like, "Nope, you got me. I'm my bad. Let's turn around." Okay, we'll do that. <laughs> well, but you feel for the driver because Sir Keith threatened to fire him, and he needs that job. He's just a working Joe trying to working get by. Joe. All these 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 middle and upper class twits are, are messing with my ability to just make it make a paycheck. And Sir Keith even said, "You know what? I may forget about this." And that was a gratitude scene. And that's when they get hit by that oncoming bus, right? Uh, and like you said, there's people with their faces being rubbed in goo. Um, there's there's uh, Liz and the and uh, Lutford Stewart are just hyping up the authoritarian nonsense, <laughs> and yet it's weirdly dark. This is a weirdly bleak couple of episodes right yeah. um uh i mean i also laugh because that that's digging into the earth is not how the earth disintegrates and, and boils away into space that, that's not how any of that works um it has strong dalek energy of we're going to drill into the earth and drive it around like a spaceship uh but <laughs> it's reference the to pressure the earth. from from the gas of the energy source and immediate right. impacts it, yeah I, but at the same time, none of that matters. It, it, what no. what matters here is, is is the surface level, which is someone involved with the science experiments has forgotten health and safety and has decided that his what he wants to do is more important, and he will accidentally or intentionally tr- destroy the Earth because of his arrogance. That that's what what is happening here, and most everyone dies. Yeah. in the infernal earth it, it is a bleak ending i mean and there's only so much green werewolf benton that can kind of diminish the fact that this is a really bleak ending 
Do, do you know that Benton's performance as a primoid was inspired by Richard the <laughs> Third? If you if you notice by his work as a Yeti, but <laughs> if you notice Sergeant Benton's movements are distinctively different than the other primoids, and this is a fact. If you go to do, if you look it up, it, 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 oh wait, you're not making this up. This is real. Oh oh no, it's real. Oh well, my it, God. it's wiki. It's at least wiki real because I, I read it the other day. I was like, really okay, but I, uh. I had to bring it up because I love Benton. And Benton is taking classical theater and infusing it into the role. That is it for masterpiece theater today. The the actor who plays Benton is amazing because because he was a suit actor, right? He originally played uh, one of the Yeti in in uh, Trout and Era, um, and he l- literally became Benton because in that <laughs> serial they needed another soldier and he was around, <laughs> so he got the <laughs> job. Um, and and so he's he's one of those actors that that just was supposed to just be kind of screen filler because that was what he just gets hired to do. And then everyone loved him and he just kept getting bigger and bigger roles. So, so John Levine is just a treasure. <laughs> All right. So the episode itself, I will, I will let some of those random tidbits, other tidbits I know go. It's the reason it works so well is because of the high level of acting that we have going on. And as cheesy as it looks sometimes now, but when they step outside to see how red and everything is behind them, that yep. reinforces the actual horror of their situation. Like that is grisly and gruesome when you see it. And admittedly, mm-hmm. um, Liz and the brig make me wonder how there's any scenery left after all the chewing they did on it. But <laughs> it is fabulous. It's it's um a lot of people dismiss melodrama and talk down about melodrama, but this is an example of how melodrama can work, right? It's like if the situation is also equally heightened, when you have heightened acting, it ended up being on the same level and it all works. And this is – you're absolutely right. Um, the BBC in 1971 cannot put on a realistic dystopian future that looks like it's a nuclear holocaust. But they can hire people to act like it is a dystopian future with a pending nuclear holocaust, and they do. And it works really well because they convince you that this is a really scary situation. So therefore, you start to realize, oh, scary situation, even though nothing on the screen is actually indicating it's a scary situation. Hands down. Oh, and But all right. We talk frequently about – I'm going to take a little bit of a step back. Frequently how the doctor doesn't kill anyone. I'm going to point out the doctor is killing primoids left and right mm-hmm. because we've established – that CO2 or a fire extinguisher thing which can kill most primates, not Stallman. Stallman just slows down. It kills the rest of them. And they're killing those guys left and right. So if you ever say the doctor doesn't kill, I want someone to remember this episode specifically. No, no. Um, with I his own two hands! Eddie, he did it with his own two hands! There's, there's so much evidence doctor kills. It's not- funny um although this this scene this is how my brain works um uh it reminded me of a scene from one of the eighth doctor audios uh really long story short um doctor and two companions are trapped in a a a, a, a escape pod and they're looking doing inventory and one of the companions goes i found a fire extinguisher huh gallifrey fire extinguishers look exactly like human fire extinguishers and then the next day i watched this episode with him with a fire extinguisher and i'm like oh so i see (laughs) The doctor's exposure to Gallifrey and fire extinguishers helped him out in this <laughs> scenario. My brain is a scary place to be, Chris. I actually think that he started collecting fire extinguishers after this, and that's still an earth fire extinguisher that he just has. <laughs> yes. I found I, – I, now everywhere I go, I have to have a fire extinguisher with me because of that one time in 1871. And the parallel you universe. never know when a prime one's going to jump up. So Right? Exactly. Shh. I was up to Benton differently ever since. So I I love to watch the brigade leader slowly break down. And you even there's even like a originally in my notes I had a specific moment like this is where Liz turns. Cause you can see yep. the actress make a choice, like, I'm kind of believing you, you know, maybe, maybe to just like a flick of a switch. Yep. And you even get one where Petra starts sending up to the brigade leader who is pushing her in a horrible situation for like a scientist and to know that like in this reality these are people that had to be subservient to him the entire time right um and this is why this well we both said that these parallel characters end up making the characters that they're 
tied to stronger because, like I said before, the Brigadier is played as in nothing bases him. And until this point, it can come across as a cardboard character. The, the Brigadier, nothing bases him. But now we're seeing, like, no, anybody who's not specifically our Lethbridge Stewart in these situations would crack because this is a ludicrous amount of pressure. And we see that. And so now we have a lot more respect for our Lethbridge Stewart because, like, in spite of everything, he doesn't crack. The show's going, no, a normal person cannot handle this kind of stress. We're showing what, hap what would happen if this, if a different Lethbridge Stewart was not the same heroic character that we know. And so we end up getting more respect for Lethbridge Stewart as a result. I mean, again, this is the same character who, 15 years from now, is going to shoot a, a fey queen in the face and make a joke about it. This is this is Lethbridge Stewart. Nothing, nothing phases him. This is a man that shot and killed the devil. Like I, you say, fake yeah. queen. I'm going to go back to shot and killed the devil. Oh yeah, no. Well, that, that that's coming up very soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I also want to take a moment because it'll be very important shortly that the Sutton here has been working with him for a while. You get that from the relationships that he's built with Petra, with Stallman, and everyone else. That he is still. Still the rebel amongst all of them, but he's been here, unlike our Sutton, who showed up an hour ago on Prime mm -hmm. Earth. Just putting that out there. Yeah. Um, anything else about these? Because, I, well, I love it, and I could prattle on about the intensity of the scene. We should move on to the last episode. Um, I, I, honestly, I, I think that's that's everything. I mean, we, uh, it, it's, it's, like I said before, we basically have a four-episode story inside of a seven episode story um it is it was interesting to me that it took so long to flash back to the real earth and to show that stuff was still ongoing because the way the show was structured we have interestingly we have kind of two episode beats first two episodes we think the show's gonna be one way and then second two episodes okay now we're in a parallel universe apparently this is the, actually the story and then the third <laughs> chunk of two episodes is you know actually um these stories are in parallel and we're seeing them kind of slowly coming to a, a point. And then the last episode is actually the, the climax of, of both of these stories converging. So it's not just like the Daleks where it's just seven interminable episodes of the same story stretched out far too long. <laughs> this is only mildly padded um, because it's actually trying to do a few things at once. And it's carefully and steadily makes the story more complicated in a nice sustained pace because by the time we get to episode six – we have two different sets of events going on simultaneously. One set of events is characters that we like or versions of them being murdered, while another set of them are starting to make the same mistakes we saw happening in the parallel universe. There's a lot of 4971 really complicated structure happening here. It, it's, it's almost – it's not quite Stephen Moffat levels, but I mean this is – one of the rare times where Doctor Who is actually starting to play with time and structure a bit that we, don't, we have not seen prior to this really. Yeah, it's brilliant. Episode 7, the finale. After the doctor says, fuck y'all, I'm out, Liz discovers his unconscious body. Stallman increases the acceleration beyond safety measures by another 3%. While in a coma, the doctor is mumbling about what they need to do from what he saw on the parallel Earth that is, out, that it was further ahead in the timeline than they were. The Brig wonders how he knows about the leak, how he knows all these things. Liz believes he knows what's going on and immediately takes action as any good companion would. Mm -hmm. Petra, Sutton, and Liz execute the Doctor's plan without telling Stallman. The Doctor awakens, discusses infinite universes and free will. He, can, he convinces a returned Sir Keith, who merely has his arm in a bandage, <clears throat> to aid him in stopping the drilling from penetrating the Earth crust. They enter the lab. Stallman's there, but the doctor loses his temper and starts banging on machineries. And Stallman orders him to be taken away, and the drilling goes on. Stallman then locks himself inside the core behind heat shields and transforms into the monster. When he emerges, only Stallman can give the order to stop, but since he is a primoid, they dispatch him, they shut down the drilling, and we have a comical scene of the doctor says, Brig, you're a pompous ass and tries to dematerialize away only to appear in a rubbish heap and come back to ask the break for help. And we end on Liz laughing at situation and the last we will see of Liz as a regular series companion. Right. 
Right. Um, so one, Liz was done wrong. Just hands down. Because next episode, see, oh yeah, she went off to college or she, she went to a university to teach or Back something. Cambridge. And, yeah. And it's just like, it's done wrong. Put it out there. This was, this was, obviously they didn't intend for her to not come back, um, but they didn't, there's nothing, there's nothing here. The worst companion write-off of all time. Uh, really? Okay. The one I hate want, the most. Let's put it that way. Do want, <laughs> there's one I hate more than this. Which one? Do you want oh, to talk okay. about Perry? Purple Gilliam Brown? Uh, at least she was given an ending, but yeah, she was, are, are, was married off to someone who had her head shaved and was told, yeah, marry this horrible warlord, you'll be fine. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. <clears throat> All right. So one of them. There we go. One of the worst. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, we get to episode seven, and the moral of the whole story is – you should have listened to the computer, apparently. Yeah. Because there's a lot of time spent on this computer. And at no point anyone's going, maybe the computer could be wrong. Nope. Computer's infallible. We must break it. We learned from the genius Frank Herbert in Dune that you should always listen to a computer. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> Oh, I couldn't even say that with a straight face. Um, uh, well, no, we we get the thing that I think the actual moral that you know also is that you should temper science with the needs of humanity. I think it's really what it boils oh, sure, down sure. to. Right. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting is is in a world where AI is a topic of discussion. Um, there actually is an interesting moral of, of the human component to science and, and how that relates. Uh, it's just weird that the doctors, if you look at computer in the way we look at computers now, it looks a bit odd. If you look at the way it's probably intended, which is this tool is being misused and the humans are not correctly using this tool and they're allowing unyielding fidelity to a plan to change what should be ethical about science then the, the actual moral hangs together you're absolutely right that's the actual moral here is that science needs to be tempered with with uh, human components it cannot just be unchecked uh but because our relationship with computers is so different now it does land a bit weird in terms of just yeah. this weird <laughs> obsession with, with with computers the the other moral i got is is fuck the system because if they had not let Stallman, with all his bureaucratic system authority, do what he was doing, none of this would have happened. So, in fact, right. they a, a little-known group, who I'll only tell you the name of the song was right, when they said, fuck the police. There you go. <laughs> Scholars of our time have told you the, the meaning of this, of this serial decades later. Well, I mean... Then we get into the weird thing of, so you should trust the military, which is not a great answer either. One of the things I want to point out that's not in this, though, is when that when they first introduced Unit, it was interesting when the brigadier explained Unit to Jamie. He was like, because Jamie's like, so you're basically the police, you arrest people and everything else. The brigadier said, no, we're empowered to investigate things. And so that was like an interesting distinction they were even making during Troughton's era. Mm-hmm. So just a, a random one off that's tangentially related, but I thought it was interesting. Right, and, and <clears throat> unit um, diverges from that. Let's put it that way. Over the course of Pertwee's run, um, and sometimes in uncomfortable ways. We're not there yet, to be fair. Yeah. Uh, um, we're still kind of in the uh, we're an investigative unit that hilariously still believes their secret, um, well, which is they are even more hilarious in in, in a bit here. <laughs> They are. They just wear costumes that say unit. They run around with guns all over the country and they have some level of influence and they go into places and everyone refers to them as unit. They're utterly secret. Right. Utterly secret, right. Um, we're, we're not quite to the point where <clears throat> random people on the street can direct you to the unit headquarters yet, but we're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, so an interesting question for you then. 
for the new who, how do you like the fact that Kate Stewart is in charge of new who? So I will say that there's some of the Kate Stewart stuff I haven't either. I haven't watched or I don't remember well. Um, so I'm a little fuzzy on how it all plays out. Um, because, but I have been rewatching the Rusty Davies stuff where it's unit, but without Kate Stewart and Russell T. Davies Wait. is a little more. The, the, uh, Harriet Jones. P. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's no real head of unit. Um, at one point, the nominal head of unit turns out to be an alien. Another point, the <laughs> nominal head of unit uh, uh, is very clearly meant to be the same nominal head of unit from Battlefield. Um, and she's ineffectual, which is frustrating. Uh, then the third nominal head of unit uh, is off screen for most of it. Um, so unit becomes kind of a thing that happens because it's Doctor Who. Uh, and, Kate Stewart comes back, my memory of it is that there's a little more digging into, okay, let's actually make this a proper supporting mm -hmm. casting in. Uh, and it ties into some of the uh, defunding, um, do with the resources what you have, uh, and attempt to get closer back to it. And I feel like uh, unit breaks into two chunks, which is the, the actual secret organization becomes Torchwood, which is also hilariously not secret, but that's a separate issue. Um, and then unit becomes more the protectors of the earth, which is not what their original mandate yeah. was. Uh, so it's doing something different now, I think. And I think it's found an actual place for itself because there's rumors that it's going to be a spinoff unit show. Um, I'm which you should have do with that. Martha, if it is in a real role. But right, I agree. I'm very similar to you, but because when unit showed up with Russell T. Davies, I was dissatisfied with how they chose to address it. It was more of a joke that they used in the show. Mm -hmm. Given the history of unit with the show and Davies's love of it felt like that should have been something that was treated better, but it felt like it was a vehicle just so they could have the spinoff of Torchwood because they were trying to downplay how effective unit was so they could create Torchwood. When Kate took over, it became more scientifically focused with a military attachment. So, almost the inverse of what we have here, which is like militarily focused with science. This was science with military. Right. And I remember, um, Kate's more scientist. <clears throat> yeah. And, and when, uh, they really amped her up during a Capaldi run, um, uh, like the Zygon inversion, um, there was some great Dr. Lethbridge Stewart speeches that very much evoked this era, uh, the high points of this era, Yeah, which is that, um, the doctor doesn't understand what humans need to do to protect their world and the humans don't understand the doctor's unchecked idealism. And there becomes an interesting conversation that's not a simple answer, which is happens actually pretty rarely in the Pertwee era, but this is the ideal of the Pertwee era. Oh, love it. Oh, sorry to, to delve into random unit stuff, but this is what we get, really get to get into unit. And I said it's top and I'll say it again, I love unit. I love the concept of it. And because I love how it's, military and i use military in quotation marks but mm. it becomes definitely more military the later the more we see it but like right now where it's more investigative they have some influence they have soldiers that they use but they don't they're not like military military and i like the idea of it because you have a force that can fight aliens but they're primarily trying to investigate and do things like that and they're mm. trying a scientific approach right now because it has worked in the past when they had the doctor of those other two occasions and that is that is why you get the feeling the brigadier is so open to it it's like he's seen it in action, and that's how they solve problems. And he thinks that will be more successful. Right. I mean, one of the things that, particularly in this early part we are, that I do love, I, we, I didn't mention it with, with Lethbridge Stewart, but um, when you and I did our space opera run, we talked about which captain is the best. And one of the things we kind of settled on as a criteria was team leadership. Mm -hmm. And Lethbridge Stewart is a great team leader because he finds people that can do the jobs that are smarter than him and lets them do their job generally. Sometimes he interferes, but it's always the interference is usually in the form of I feel like this is leading us down a road that will put people in danger or I have been given orders that I cannot countermand. I need to implement them. Um, he doesn't interfere because he feels uh, uh, belittled or threatens it. He, and he doesn't need to understand the problem. He just needs to understand the solution. Uh, mm -hmm. and from that perspective, Lethbridge Stewart is always written really well as someone who just trusts his team to do their job. And one of the great points about Lethbridge Stewart though, is that he is, sometimes he's given orders and he knows they're wrong 
and he does not not do the orders, but he finds his own loophole. So he's doing the order, but allowing the team the opportunity to do what they need to do to actually fix their own problem. So yep. like that he is an incredibly team. fine balance. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, he's very good at protecting his team, which is again a great sign of a team leader. All right, so we've we've prattled on. I guess we can we can wrap this up unless you have any final comments about in- Inferno. Um, honestly, no. Uh, uh, Inferno is uh, I have quibbles with it. I haven't actually really gone into my quibbles um, because they're not they're they're just that they're small. Um, I mean, it, it's a bit long. Uh, I joked about it's better than the Daleks, but I mean, it's still seven episodes of 70s television and it, the story doesn't quite hold for seven episodes. Uh, Liz was done wrong. Um, Stallman is not much of a character and frankly, not much of a threat. You're right. The primoids are kind of shoehorned in, but none of that matters, really. It comes down to this is one of the times you can really look at Doctor Who and go, Doctor Who at certain eras – lives or dies on a supporting cast and this is one hell of a supporting cast hands down did you have an ending quote for this week i did not do that i forgot oh no (laughs) so for for me inferno still holds up amongst all the classic episodes of doctor who that we've watched so far and ones i know that we'll Mm -hmm. watch in the future this would still be in the top tier. And it's one of the reasons I chose it because it was, it was difficult when we were trying to figure out which episodes we wanted to watch because we each picked one per doctor, which one I wanted mm-hmm. to go with. Cause I really enjoy this one. Part of me wanted to do Planet of the spiders simply because it is the end of the third doctor. And that is something that could have been interesting to discuss also, but there's just so much goodness in this episode that it could easily have been a modern episode with some cuts to it. Yeah. And yeah, I just want to say, if you haven't seen Inferno, you should go see it. I don't know why you're listening to us proud on about it. And I vamped a couple minutes to see if Eddie wanted to find a line. If not, I, I have, I, I have now, I've now Googled the line, um, uh, um, which is, uh, from the clause of access, um, doctor saying, obviously the time Lords have programmed the TARDIS always to return to earth. It seems like I'm some kind of galactic yo-yo. <laughs> Um, what can people expect next time we tune into Doctor Who in color? Uh, so next time we're going to jump ahead a little bit, uh, to, uh, the next companion, Joe Grant, and we're going to watch the demons or the demons, depending on how you want to pronounce the AE in the middle of that. Um, there's five episodes, uh, in the next season. Um, so on the upside, uh, you can see, uh, Joe Grant and we'll talk about that. Um, and the master and downside, you can see Mike Gates and you can deal with that. So, so I I will do want to say I think this is the last episode that'll be as long as it is going forward because I can't really think of any other seven episode arcs. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Now, there are no more seven episodes after this now. Uh, um, but there are some six after this. So um, if people are looking to purchase your amazing swag or find out more about Pugmire. Or what you and Matthew talk about when you talk about wrestling. Where can they find you and get your stuff? (laughs) Um, The best place to find really all of my stuff is my website uh, these days. Um, And that is at Pugsteady, which is P-U-G-S-T-E-A-D-Y dot com. Uh, From there, you can find my social media accounts. Um, If you're interested in stuff like this, but it's not actually this, um, there's also the Onyx Pathcast, where we mostly talk about Onyx Path products, but occasionally we do talk about uh, uh, wrestling or uh, Neil Breen movies or or the like. (laughs) Um, But if you just want to chat, frankly, the best place to find me is uh, uh, the Darker Hue Discord, where um, Chris and I basically just treat it like our own fiefdom and and talk about stuff that we think is funny. Uh. If you're if you're looking to buy my stuff, you can go to my website, darkestudios.com. You can go to IPR's website and buy Haunted West that I think they're slowly dwindling out of. I'll keep saying that every week, probably for the next 10 years until it's gone. And <laughs> Eddie is now shocked to know that I said this podcast is going to run for another 10 years. Um, if you're <laughs> looking for me, just come to Dark Who Discord. Really, that's the best place. Otherwise, I'll just be like promoting books and stuff because I feel that's what I need to do on social media. Yep, yeah, sure. So with that, next week, uh, where you get to watch the devil arrive to Doctor Who.